and we're back here in Inside the Ropes, and I'm joined by one of the kings of wrestling himself, the one and only Mr. Chris Hero. Chris, how you doing? I am fantastic. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's good to talk to you, and uh, I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're so, we're in the pandemic, but we feel like we're coming out of the pandemic. It must be weird for you, because now you're launching this podcast, Can, can Chris Hero Save Wrestling with Conrad Thompson? Who better to launch a podcast with? I mean, he's the podfather, right? <laughs> Uh, it's a great platform for me. Uh, I think Comrade and I have good rapport. Uh, we have a good relationship with one another. Uh, but a lot of the topics that I'll be covering on this podcast are things that he isn't as familiar with as, as he is with his other uh, co-hosts. So I'm really excited to tell some stories and get some information out there. And the name is a bit cheeky. Can Chris Hero save wrestling? Is wrestling something that, need, that needs to be saved? But this is just my opportunity to try to preserve certain parts of the history of pro wrestling. And I give little bits of advice at the end toward, uh, you know, young up and coming wrestlers. And I'm just trying to take things and push them forward in, in the right direction. And this is just a really great opportunity for me and adfreeshows.com. They've been great. Um, it's just, uh, it's a great experience and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. And you know, even, I, I should just quickly mention it because obviously today uh, we got the sad news about Butch Reed. Um, and you've been kind of tweeting about that as well. And that, I guess that kind of plays into, you know, preserving the history of wrestling because Butch Reed might be someday, if you're a you know WWE fan, that, you know, maybe you only remember seeing him on WrestleMania 3. But, you know, if you delve into it, there's so much more to something like Butch Reed and what he contributed. Yeah. <clears throat> Butch Reed is a guy might be most known for his run with Ron Simmons's Doom. Um, he also had that little stint in WWF as the natural with the bleach blonde hair and managed by Slick. Uh, but those are just very, you, you know that and you know that. Um, he has a, a rich history in the territories. Uh, he had some great matches with Ric Flair. There's obviously an excellent match with Buddy Landell out there that a lot of people love. But outside of shoot interviews with Butch Reed, a lot of stuff isn't necessarily covered. Uh, so in addition to the stuff we're going to discuss with my career, I look forward to doing my own research and learning as much as possible about certain things, certain aspects of pro wrestling history and trying to deliver that in a way that's interesting, entertaining and educational. One of the things I was listening to the podcast and I, one of the topics that you brought up that I thought was really interesting, I've thought of this a lot, is the idea that, you know, NXT has kind of evolved from, you know, being in full sale and then to the network and then to USA Network. And I thought it was a really interesting kind of topic for you to bring up. Can you talk just a little bit about, you know, you know, that whole thing about what is NXT, what's it trying to achieve and where they kind of are right now with it? Well, it's the story of two developmentals, isn't it? Um, you started off with Florida Championship Wrestling and obviously many developmentals prior to that, but NXT was born out of Florida Championship Wrestling in Tampa and they had a very specific goal at that moment uh, to train people to get them experience. They'd be on FCW television and they would prep them and send them on the road to do dark matches and get a look at them and try to come up with something to put them on TV. Uh, but NXT was born and it succeeded in a way that maybe they hoped but didn't quite anticipate and now you are getting people ready for NXT television and you're getting them ready for Raw and Smackdown and it's just there are different shows and different people that run the shows that want different things out of their performers uh, so it, it just gets a little uh, th things just get a little mixed up and I, I know that's very difficult for some of the talent there that come from backgrounds that are not pro wrestling related uh, because wrestling is just very intimidating. It's very difficult to get a grasp on, not just the, uh, you know, bells and whistles, but the nuts and bolts, but the, uh, the history of it. It's a, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, if somebody that doesn't have that love ingrained in them yet, it's very overwhelming. And you know, what are these, what, what are these talent getting ready for? Are they getting ready for NXT TV? Or are they getting ready for Raw or SmackDown? Or are they just learning how to have a regular match? Um, so I think they just, there needs to be 
a division in the developmental so that they're the new talent are not getting overwhelmed by trying to live up to an Adam Cole, Johnny Gargano takeover match, because that is far away from what they need to be working on when they, when they first get there. It's uh it's just a tricky process. It's, it's an unenviable process. I don't, I wouldn't, like to be the guy who's tasked with figuring out the right way to do all these things because pro wrestling just changes so much with time that it's you know you you pick a pick a plan of attack but it's not necessarily going to be always the right one well you know it's because one of the things I, I often think about is you know guys like maybe ricochet and alistair black who were put up on the main roster and you know in reality you know what they'd been doing in nxt was never going to be what they would be doing in the main roster and then when they go up, it's kind of this weird, uh, you know, what are they going to do? Do they, you know, what, what do they want from them? I wonder for you as someone who was there kind of at the start of NXT and then there, you know, recently, for someone like you who was a veteran and everything, did things change a lot for you or did things stay, stay similar for you? Uh, I think things were very different for me because when I was there the first time, I very much had the reputation of an independent wrestler whose um, habits and way he does things, you know, the, the way I would have matches and such needed to be changed and put through the system. And um, indie, indie wrestling was very much a dirty word where it was used as uh, almost like an insult, like, oh, that's what they do on the indies, right? When I had come back the second time, things had obviously changed. The landscape was completely different. I mean, I'm sitting in Terry Taylor's class with Shinsuke Nakamura, right? And that's that's <laughs> way different than what I was doing in 2012 and 2013. So independent wrestling wasn't quite as taboo as it was considered back then. And a lot of the people that had come up through NXT and that were present in the Performance Center were people that I had encountered all throughout my career. And, you know, almost like wrestling siblings, if you will. So I had a great bit more of respect, you know, a, a bigger amount of respect um, when I went back the second time, at least among the talent, you know. So it just, uh, it was just a different environment, a different atmosphere. Not that they didn't also in 2017, 18, 19, didn't want me to adapt certain things. It just, um, it was just a little bit of a, a different process, a little bit easier for myself. And then, um, you know, obviously last year you left WWE and it was a weird time because everything's going on and nothing's really open. How have you kind of been able to deal with everything the last kind of few months and, and figure out, I guess, a game plan for what you're going to do? Well, everything is so uncertain right there are a couple a couple companies that are that are running regularly and then a lot of the smaller companies just either are able to only run under certain restrictions or they're just not running at all and i just sort of made a decision when i got let go that i was not going to just jump back into this crazy uncertain world and cause you know, cause more chaos to my life, to other people's lives. Uh, I just wanted to kind of sit back and watch things develop and be able to pick and choose where I go. And that's still where I am at this moment. I don't love the idea of consistent traveling with uh, the climate of things right now. Um, working with people that I do not know very well or, or don't have a certain relationship with. I want to be very particular about what I do next. And that is just hanging out and letting things hopefully improve. I mean, we've seen a bit of improvement, but it's still not to the standards that I'm hoping, uh, hoping for. Um, so I thought this podcast was a way to get my voice out there and to um, just try to, you know, I, obviously I don't want people to forget about me. Right. But I do think a lot of the thoughts that I have are very relevant toward uh, the current wrestling scene right now. And that's something that I would like to put out there. There's, there's a lot of tribalism in pro wrestling and pro wrestling fandom these days. It seems like you have to pick one side or the other and 
you know, whatever side you pick, you're stuck with for the rest of your life, it seems. But I feel that that wrestling is not black and white. It never has been and it ever, never will be. So I want to be the calming voice somewhere in the middle that says, you know, this guy is right sometimes, but I disagree with this. And these guys are right a lot of the time, but I disagree with this. So I think it's important to kind of get my voice out there and try to, like I said, can Chris Hero save wrestling? Can I take things and salvage them as much as possible and try to push things forward in a positive direction? We could uh, we could use more voices like that on a Wednesday, that's for sure. Um, but um, one of the, I mean, one thing that I saw actually, I was I was reading an article about you, and I ended up reading the comments, and there was a bunch of people who kept saying they want to see Chris Hero in the G one at some point. Is that something that you would look at doing? Is that something that you're open to? I guess you know it's just worth kind of throwing out there. Um, absolutely. Uh, there's a number of those guys that I have already had matches with over the years, and. It, the G1 is such a challenging and physically excruciating tournament that something I would I would love to be in if it was the right situation. Um, I most recently have worked in Japan for Pro Wrestling Noah. Uh, you know, I did probably about 15 tours for them over the years, and I have always had a good relationship with them. Um, they are under different ownership now and they have different people behind the scenes and a, a very different roster. Um, but also, you know, I know a lot of the people from, from New Japan from either wrestling them on independent shows or on NOAA shows. So I have a good relationship with all those people. And the G1 is something I would love to sink my teeth into at the right moment in the right situation. And just a couple of questions about your, your WWE run. I guess one of the major questions was, was there ever any serious conversation about you going to the main roster? Is that something you ever wanted to do when you were there? Um, talk, talk me through that. There was never a, a conversation with me about, hey, let's get ready to pitch you going on the main roster at this point you know it's not something that was um, ever discussed in that way uh, it's something that was on my mind but not something that I was pushing for heavily because I just kind of understood the landscape of things I knew my position in NXT uh, I knew the people that they were getting ready to call up and the people that they had groomed um, I had conversations with various people over the years, you know, like a, like a Paul Hammond, for instance. And it's just a matter of trying to figure, trying to present yourself in a way that someone up there is going to go, Oh, okay. I see how this can fit in with what we're doing. Uh, but I never made a, a, a strong push for that because I just didn't think it was too realistic at the time. Um, it's, not something I'm particularly disappointed by, but you know, there's so many people up there that I have great in-ring chemistry with. Um, there's a lot of opportunities that I think I could have done pretty well with. Um, but I just, my brain doesn't focus too much on, on the woulda, coulda type things. So it's not something that weighs heavily on me, but it has something that's crossed my mind. I, I do need to ask you about the, the big story that, you know, CM Punk's talked about, Roman Reigns has talked about it, that you were initially going to be the third man in the Shield um, that Punk wanted at the time back in 2012. I mean, how much of that permeated to you? Um, what can you tell us from your point of view about that? Okay, so the thing that, a little thing that annoys me about this is people heard the podcast with Punk and then they put that information out there and it just kind of took a life of its own. When Punk pitched the trio of myself, Ambrose and Rollins, there was no shield concept. It was just, hey, let's, let's pair these three guys with me, right? So technically I was never supposed to be a member of the shield because the shield didn't exist when this was pitched. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, that's a thing that I see on Twitter pretty much every other day. I think it's a little annoying because it's deviated so far from the original source of it. Um, I found out just when everybody else found out by listening to the CM Punk on the art of wrestling podcast. Uh, I'd never had a conversation with him about this and there are, I mean, these things happen all the time where 
you pitch ideas or you, you talk about things, but the last thing you want to do is get someone's hopes up by say, Hey man, I, I pitched this and da, 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 whatever. I, you know, I'm going to do my best to get this to work. And then if it doesn't work, it's just unnecessary, uh, bad feelings, not bad, bad feelings, but you understand my point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so listening to that podcast was the first time I had heard that. Uh, I never had a conversation with punk about this still to this day. I have not, uh, cause I don't really know what the point of the conversation would be. <laughs> uh, people ask me if I think I could have been successful in the shield. And of course my answer is yes, of course. <laughs> I think I can take anything that's given to me and make the most out of it. Uh, unfortunately people like to pit this as a me versus Roman Reigns thing, which is very silly, uh, because he's, a, an incredible performer. He's one of a kind, he's got his own thing figured out. Um, and there's really no reason to compare the two of us, uh, especially when I wasn't pitched for a shield because a shield didn't exist yet. So, I mean, do you, I mean, I know it's, it, this is all, it's all kind of fantasy speak now, but you know, mm -hmm. if you guys hadn't up as a trio in 2012, I mean, you know, you could have done it, you know, you would have smashed it, but I mean, it's, it's fun to think about how like wrestling would have been different, you know, would, would Roman Reigns have been able to get to where he was without being in the shield at that point or where you would have gone at that point if you had been in a trio with Punk? It's pretty interesting to, to think about the scenarios. Yeah, I think so. And shield or not, I think Roman would have been a star. Uh, the shield, uh, the six-man tag, uh, just the package of them allowed Roman to gain experience without being exposed early on. Not that he would have been exposed, but he just did not have the experience that those other guys did or the experience of their opponents. So similar to the Wyatt family where they were all able to exist at the same time, but they're not all out there having 20 minute matches where you can see all of their strengths and all their weaknesses at the same time. And uh, that's just the beauty, beauty of a faction or the beauty of having a manager or a tag team partner that you can work to complement each other. Um, and, you know, I think that is a bit of a problem with wrestling where back in the day, so you go back and you look at, uh, you look at ECW in the mid nineties, mid to late nineties. And some of these, some of these guys are packaged so carefully and they're camouflaged so well that you don't get to see their weaknesses because their matches aren't super long. Um, they don't wear out their welcome. And I think there's so much um, homogenization of pro wrestling now where it seems like everybody has to lock up the same way. Everybody has to throw a drop kick. Everybody has to do a chase spot with the ropes every, you know, and I think some of that it comes from the top on down as far as being encouraged to do things a certain way. But then I also think there's a bit of a responsibility of the talent to take it upon themselves to try to not follow every single trend that is successful in pro wrestling. Um, Daniel Bryan is a guy that is great at just every couple of months, he picks something and he changes course. And he does, uh, he does a lot of the things that make him him but he also tries to move forward and, and create his own trends in a certain way. I worked with him a lot in Ring of Honor, and I know that that was a, a big thing of having all of these long uh, title matches with so much pressure on the line of main eventing all these different towns. But how do I make these matches different? How can I give them the greatest hits, but at the sa same time, play stuff off of my new album that will be received and not, uh, <laughs> you know, not uh, uh, talked through or, or forgotten about. Yeah, for sure. And um, I also wanted to ask you, but obviously when you were in WWE for the two runs, people always talk about the Kings of Wrestling. There's always the idea would there be a re reuniting of the Kings of Wrestling in WWE. Was there ever a conversation? Was it ever a possibility to happen? Uh, I know people want me to ask that. Uh, no, there was not. Uh, when Cesaro and I had our tryout and uh, Triple H pulled us aside and he kind of gave us an idea that they would be offering us a contract, he said, one of the first things he said was, this is not to bring you guys in as a team, 
Uh, this is to bring you guys in separately and develop you separately. Whatever happens down the road happens, but this is not, hey, you guys are being signed as a team. Uh, so I never had any thoughts or hopes that somebody would see something, right? Um, Cesaro also got a, you know, maybe like a five month head start down in FCW. Uh, so by the time I got in and was doing stuff, he was getting ready to go up to the main roster. So I did not spend a lot of time in developmental with him. And, you know, if, if anything, we were opponents, um, you know, we had a match on FCW television. We, we had some three ways and such um, on some of the shows down there. And then the one time that we did team was on a full sale dark match against punk and Seth Rollins. That was punk's idea. He's the one that pitched it and they went with it. So it started out, I believe as uh, punk versus Cesaro. Um, Oksana was there. She, she caused some kind of a DQ. I ran out, we started beating up punk and then here comes, um, I believe he was the NXT champion at the time, uh, Seth Rollins. And we started just, just one of those house show style tag matches to send the crowd home happy. Um, and then also when my 20th anniversary as a pro wrestler, uh, came around, wasn't on the exact date, but around the same time frame, uh, we were able to get it worked out in, an NXT at an Orlando live event that I wrestled Adam Cole. And then the, here comes the undisputed era to put the boots to me. And then here comes Cesaro out to make the save. And we had like a nice moment. You can, you can look online to see some videos of that, but that was a really cool personal moment for me mm -hmm. to be able to have that match with Cole, you know, somebody that I've known since he broke in and then to share that moment afterwards with Cesaro uh, it was very cool, but while it would have been awesome to team with him at, at various parts throughout our career, um, I did not have any illusions that that was going to happen. I mean, it's funny because you know, you never know what's true, but there's stories out there that Cesaro's contract's up soon. So maybe down the line, we can see the Kings of Wrestling reunite somewhere else. So that's a fun prospect uh, to think about. Yeah, that's that's pro wrestling, right? You 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 can almost say never, but never say never. And then the last thing I wanted to ask you, I wanted to just try and ask you something different. So you are you you are an encyclopedia of pro wrestling. You know so much about it. So give us a, a match that you don't think is like that everybody has seen that people should see that's maybe on YouTube. Something that people can just type into YouTube and check out that you think is hmm. worth the show. Hmm. Man, on the spot. <laughs> um, so I just did... I just, uh, I'll give you a, a handful of recommendations. Um, I just did the, the, the Tracy Smothers episode for Can Chris Hero Save Wrestling. And throughout my research of that, I went back and watched a lot of his matches. And, you know, it's, he's a person that is very near and dear to me, but it's also great to detach from that and watch footage of his matches before, before I ever met him. Um, cause he had just such a expansive body of work. You know, he started, started down in the, the Memphis territory, Nashville. He worked in mid South. He made his way to continental to Florida, uh, eventually ended up in the NWA or WCW. Uh, he was one of the, you know, flag bearers literally of Smoky Mountain wrestling ended up in ECW. Then you've got IWA Mid-South. He was on the first ever IWA Mid-South show. He was on the first ever OVW show. And then the first ever one PW show in the UK, which is a company you may have heard of before. Yep. Um, he just, I don't know of anybody that was able to constantly evolve from day one in his career all the way up until the end. Um, I just rewatched some of these ladder matches that he had with Chris Candido. Um, and they're just, they're really awesome. They were happening at the very same time that Razor and Sean were having their matches, literally the same months. Um, I think Cornette must have picked up the idea from them and said, hey guys, you want to have ladder matches? And uh, they went and had 10 matches and like 10 ladder matches in 14 days or something ridiculous like that. Um, so I would recommend going back and watching some of these Chris Candido, Tracy Smothers ladder matches. There's one from a house show. You don't have the entire match available, but, um, you know, you set up the ladder in the corner and you, you know, whip the guy to, and he takes, you know, he 
goes face first under the ladder. We've seen it a hundred times. It is one of the more tame spots when it comes to things that we've seen in ladder matches. Well, this ladder is much taller than you would expect. It's kind of hanging over the top rope. And Tracy never did anything half speed. So he hits this thing and his momentum carries him. And the ladder flips to the floor and Tracy takes this god-awful flip bump right to the floor <laughs> somewhere in K Kentucky or Tennessee. And thankfully they had footage of it. It was just a house show. But uh, And there's one where Candido pulls out like this wooden ladder because that's the only ladder they had at the time. And this thing's not even five feet tall. And they're, you know, just still doing the slow wrestler climb up the ladder. That's kind of amusing. Um, and I told the story on the podcast, but the one ladder match where that really stood out most to me, they're both fighting up on this ladder. It's not a wooden ladder. It actually is a metal ladder. And they're, you know, trading back and forth, one, two, one, two, one, two. And then he finally goes to knock Candido off and you see the ladder snap under them and they both go flying off this thing. And the problem with this one, not, not, that their health was just risked and they could have broken something or concussed something or stabbed themselves with, with the ladder. They only have one ladder, right? This isn't, you know, this is, this is not 2020 where you can just magically pull out three more ladders from under the ring. They've only got one ladder and their last bastion of hope is referee Mark Hildebrand. Uh, sorry, referee Mark Curtis, Brian Hildebrand. I just combined his names. He has, he's 115 pounds and this man has to hold this broken ladder as Tracy climbs up to, to grab the thing off the top. And it's just, it's such a spectacle. It's so reckless and chaotic, but at the same time, it's, it's just, uh, it's a masterpiece, you know, it's just a cool, cool little time capsule to look back on knowing what we know now about ladder matches. Well, that, that's my night sorted, just uh, trying to find that. That bump that uh, Tracy takes over the top rope. Uh, mm. Listen, Chris, I want to thank you so much for your time. Can Chris Hero save wrestling? The answer is probably yes, but you're going to have to tune in on adfreeshows.com to find out. Uh, is there anything else you want to plug? Anywhere else that you want people to go? Uh, so I have started a new Twitter with, my, um, with this podcast to... Um, I mean, I'll be answering stuff on my regular Twitter as well, at Chris Hero, but this one is at Can Chris Hero. And there I talk a little bit more with people giving feedback to the show. Um, I would like people to send in their suggestions. I mean, I have, you know, maybe 120 topics already that may not be full entire shows, but whether it's uh, a certain time period of my career or a certain opponent or a certain match there's a lot of things but I would also just love to hear what what everybody wants to hear me talk about here Conrad and I discuss um I've got t-shirts up at pro wrestling tees of course at the end of the month I'll be doing a sign it live for high spots that'll be really cool that's the first uh, thing like that that I've done I've kept pretty quiet during the pandemic uh, but I am excited to get back at it and start doing things and eventually work my way toward an in-ring return uh, but I am not in a hurry for that I just would like to see things ease up a little bit more and kind of see how we're doing in the next couple months yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Chris, thank you for the time. Really appreciate it. And best luck with the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it.